Good evening. Mark Mulder, Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Zuckerman Holocaust Center. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Determined, the story of Holocaust survivor Avraham Perlmutter. The Zuckerman Holocaust Center began through the resolve of local survivors much like Avraham, determined to create a lasting memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. For many decades, the survivors themselves were here every day, sharing their firsthand testimony with our visitors. Today, we continue the responsibility to share and remember their stories and empower new generations to make a positive difference in the world. On behalf of the center, I want to acknowledge and thank our museum members and donors. Your generosity allows us to host programs like this at no charge, and we are grateful for your support. We are proud to present tonight's program with our community partner, the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metropolitan Detroit. I have the pleasure of introducing Reverend Dr. Charles Packer. Charles serves on the board of the Interfaith Leadership Council and is the senior minister of the Pine Hill Congregational Church in Farmington Hills and adjunct professor at the Ecumenical Theological Seminary in Detroit. He teaches courses in biblical interpretation, pastoral theology, interfaith dialogue, and research and writing methodology. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Mark. As Mark mentioned, tonight we will discuss the truly remarkable story of Avraham Perlmutter, PhD, who survived the Holocaust due to his great personal resolve, faith, and the support of many Dutch resistors to the Nazi agenda. This event is made possible through the organization of the Zeckelman Holocaust Center, which has provided access to everyone registered tonight to view the documentary Determined until December 9th, 2023. Many thanks to the program sponsor, the PNC Foundation, and program supporters, Robin and Leo Eisenberg, Susan and David Fieber, Linda and Robert Finkel, and Renee and David Silbert. As stated in the introduction, to me, I represent the community partner for the evening, the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metropolitan Detroit, serving on the Interfaith Leadership Council's Board of Directors and as co-chairperson of the Education Committee. The Interfaith Leadership Council seeks to provide opportunities for persons of different religious traditions to share, learn, and grow in understanding, together encouraging and promoting the valuing of diversity of beliefs and faiths that make up southeastern Michigan. The Interfaith Leadership Council hosts religious diversity journeys for seventh graders, produces a podcast, panels on various interfaith topics for adults, including those related to healthcare issues, and has most recently introduced the groundbreaking Bridging to Belonging initiative, which connects individuals from across the region by identifying shared community values. Ultimately, the account of this courageous and daunting journey toward liberation and safety that we have or will view in the documentary Determined has been brought to us primarily due to the efforts of Avraham's daughter, Karen Perlmutter, PhD. Karen is an award-winning scientist, publisher, and filmmaker, and is a sought-after public speaker. Her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, is in electrical engineering, and she has earned a Master of Science in, um, in uh, in electrical engineering as well, a Master of Science in Statistics, and a Doctor of Philosophy degree, all from Stanford University. She has received 39 patents for her various inventions, and she was Chief Scientist and in charge of an International Research and Development Division at AOL. She additionally developed technology for Warner Brothers Studios. One of her projects was the Transformational Ultra Resolution Film Restoration Project. During her career, Perlmutter has published many technical papers that have been honored with a number of academic awards. She's published her father's autobiography, a bestseller into English, Dutch, and most recently German, and presents regularly about her father and his experience at museums, schools, and other institutions and venues. We're privileged to be able to join the conversation she has facilitated through this film about her father's reflections and insights on the Holocaust tonight. 
Well, thank you. And I'm pleased that many of you have had the opportunity to view my documentary on my father's inspirational life story. But in case some of you haven't, I thought I would begin by reviewing some of the main aspects of his life. And I'm going to now share some slides as well. So my father was born in Vienna, Austria in 1927. He lived with his parents and his three-year older sister, Taya, and they were raised in a very religious Jewish household. My father was a wild and mischievous child. For example, when he was two and a half years old, he ran away from home in order to explore the city. And But these personality characteristics helped him to survive later on during the war. In March of 1938, when he was 10 and a half years old, a few days after Germany announced the Anschluss or Union with Austria, my father actually saw Hitler entering Vienna. After that, uh, things became bad for the Jews and the worsening conditions were epitomized by Kristallnacht on the night of November 9th to 10th, 1938. And my father was actually on the streets that night and he saw that his parents' textile store had been vandalized as was one of the synagogues that he attended. And his parents desperately you know, tried to flee from Austria as a, as a family, but repeatedly they were refused. And so my grandparents decided to send my father and aunt by the kinder transport. It was a special children's transport operation to the Netherlands because their aunt Annie and her family lived in that country and it was safe there at the time. So he left on the train with his sister on January 11th, 1939, and he was 11 years old. And that was actually the last time he saw his mother. Initially, though, the Dutch government did not release him and his sister uh, to their relatives. Instead, they had to go to refugee camps. And for almost a year, they stayed in four refugee camps. And then he got sick on, in the last refugee camp in a place called Gouda. And um, so he was sent to a hospital and quarantine facility in Amsterdam. And finally, in December of 1939, um, he was released, his relatives in The Hague. In the meantime, his sister went to a pioneer camp in a place called Lestrecht. It was for kids 14 years and older who were training to go to the British Mandate of Palestine. And the reason she was training to do that was because my grandparents had actually been able to flee from Vienna and go there during the summer of 1939. So as I mentioned, my father went to The Hague and he was actually staying with his uncle's sister's family. Their last name was Van, Van Stratton. And But just six months later, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. And five days later, the Netherlands surrendered. And then my aunt and my father were trapped in the Netherlands and they couldn't join um, you know, their parents in the British Mandate of Palestine. The situation slowly began to deteriorate for the Jews again. And in 1942, all non-Dutch Jews had to go from the coastal areas to Amsterdam. And so my father left in October 1942, and he stayed with a Jewish family he didn't know. Their last name was Cohen. And a few months after my father arrived in Amsterdam, in March 1943, when my father was 15 and a half years old, the Nazis came specifically for my father and brought him to the local deportation center. It was renamed the Jewish Theater, and that was where they would ship up Jews first to the Dutch transit camp Westerborg and then to one of the extermination camps such as Auschwitz. Well, my father decided that he had to escape. And he noticed that a pair of German soldiers that were guarding one particular exit left the door unguarded when they went to get their replacements. So in the middle of the night, when the soldiers did that, my father escaped and ran back to the Cohen house. But my father knew that the Nazis would come looking for him. So he hid in the bushes behind the house that night and tried to figure out his next move. And luckily, the very next morning, a lady from an underground organization came looking for him to ask if he wanted to go into hiding. And she was a member of an underground group founded by a man named Yup Westerville. 
And this lady had actually been sent by my aunt, she who knew that my father was in Amsterdam. She didn't know that he had been arrested and he then escaped. But fortunately, this lady showed up at the right time. And the lady helped him to his next hiding place. And for the next seven months, my father was moved to half a dozen, over half a dozen hiding places and experienced many very close captures. But each time he managed to make a successful daring escape. And one time when my father was in the city of Rotterdam, he was captured by a German soldier and put into a police wagon. And again, his first idea was he had to escape. And so when the truck slowed down to go around the corner, he opened up one of the rear doors, jumped out and ran away. And during this period, while he was on the run and in hiding, he was also helped by additional members of the Westerville group, including a man named Jan Smith and many other non-Jews. And one other aspect I like to mention is that my father loved to learn. And so during his time in hiding, he learned English and French and Spanish and even improved his chess skills. And in October, in October 1943, when he was 16 years old, he was told to travel to Venlo in southeastern Netherlands. And he was met at the train station there by the local member of the underground and the priest of the local village of Hubenforst, and his name was Pastor Vullings. And Hubenforst had about 240 families, and they were all very religious Catholics, and they actually hid more than 40 Jews. And Pastor Vullings was instrumental in making that happen. And so then my, fa my father was brought by Pastor Vullings to a family headed by Peter and Gertrude Byers. They were asparagus farmers. And three of their adult children were also living in their house, um, including Harry Byers, who was 22 at the time, and Mincha Byers, who was in her early 30s. And my father stayed at the Byers house for over a year and became very close to the Byers. But although the village had many Jews, it was still very dangerous since the mayor was pro-Nazi. And whenever he suspected a Jew was hiding in a home, he would alert the Nazis. So again, my father experienced several near captures and hearing interactions with the Nazis. For example, one time the Nazis came and lined up the entire Byers family and threatened to arrest them if they didn't say where the Jew was. But my, but they didn't tell, um, you know, the Nazis where my father was. My father was hiding under the floorboards of the Byers parents' bedroom at the time. But the buyers didn't say anything, and luckily the Nazis left. And before long, the front of the war actually moved to the area, and German soldiers were quartered in the village and, in fact, in the buyer's house. So for a while, my father was hiding in a small attic, but it was too dangerous with Nazis staying in the house. So instead, he hid in a horse stable, and when that was too dangerous, the buyer's dug a very small hole in a hill in the in the backyard and that's where my father hid he couldn't even sit up in the in this hole and in november 1944 the allies had liberated the neighboring village of zavenem and they were firing artillery shells at, at kubenpois and the german soldiers planned to take everyone to germany which was only a few miles away but my father he didn't want to go with them so we returned to the stable but he could see and hear and hear shells everywhere and he could see explosions and fire and he felt it wasn't state safe to stay there so he decided to venture toward the british lines he had left the stable and gone about 10 yards when a shell fell on the stable and it completely exploded so to him that was a sign that an angel of God was watching over him and he should continue toward the British lines. But he also knew that the roads were mined by the Germans. So he decided to crawl on his hands and knees in that direction and feel for mines. And it was completely dark. And he went a couple of hundred feet when all of a sudden Nazis jumped out from the side of the road and asked him who he was and where he was going. And just about that time, the British, who were just a couple hundred feet away, heard them and started firing in their direction. So the Nazi grabbed my father, but my father was able to break free and ran back where he came from, forgetting about mines and artillery shells, and he could hear bullets whizzing by him, but luckily none hit him. And my father ran to the house of one of the buyer's son, and the buyers were actually there since the Germans were not able to evacuate the village after all. And the next day, my father decided again to try to go to the liberated village of Zavenem, 
And he convinced Harry Byers, who was the 22 year, 23 now year old son of uh, Peter and Gertrude, to go with him. And braving the mines and their chiller shells and the bullets, they reached Zavenham. It was November 26, 1944. And that was the day of my father's liberation. He was 17 years old. And afterwards, my father became a translator for the British Army. And soon, Hubenforce was liberated. And about a month or so later, the Jewish brigade came and asked if he wanted them to help him go to the British Mandate of Palestine via France in order to reunite with his parents. But when he arrived in France, uh, he had a high fever. He went to a doctor and he found out that he had blood poisoning. And the doctor said, oh, it's a good thing he came when he did, because if he would have had it come a day later, the doctor would have had to amputate his leg. But luckily, you know, he got to keep his legs because he came when he did. And during this time in France, while he was waiting for his official papers, my father heard the news that the war had ended. He also learned that all of his Dutch relatives had been killed in concentration camps, mostly in Auschwitz. This included all of Aunt Annie's family and also the Van Strattens, the family with whom he had lived for almost three years in The Hague. It included his grandparents who had fled from Vienna to Belgium, his young cousins who had also traveled on the kinder transport with him from Vienna to the Netherlands, as well as their parents. And although the Westville group arranged hiding places for about 200 people, 20 of the original children in that pioneer camp were killed as long as, as well as some of the counselors. And more than 75% of the Dutch Jews were killed by the Nazis. Of the 140,000 Jews in pre-war Netherlands, only 35,000 survived. And my father also heard the news that his sister was caught when she was trying to cross the border with Yup Westville, the head of the underground group. So she was sent to Auschwitz and my father did not know what happened to her after that for many months. Yup Westville tragically was killed in the Dutch concentration camp Wacht in August 1944 and Pastor Vullings of Hubenforce was arrested and he died in Bergen-Belsen in 1945. After my father received his official papers, he traveled on a British ship to the British Mandate of Palestine and arrived there in July 1945. But sadly, he found out that his mother had died just two weeks before his first letter arrived, telling his parents that he had survived. A few weeks after he arrived, they received he and his father received a letter from his sister, Taya, saying that she was alive. She had survived Auschwitz, a work camp, and a death march. And she later joined my father and grandfather in the British Mandate of Palestine. And on May 14th, 1948, after the British left the area and the Jews issued a declaration of independence establishing the state of Israel and armies from five Arab countries attacked Israel, threatening a momentous massacre against the Jews, my father joined the Israeli army and helped to defend the state of Israel. And during one of his military operations, he was injured and he ended up unconscious and in a coma for a few days, but luckily he recovered and was discharged from the army as a wounded veteran. And he had always wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, but he had at last attended school at sixth grade, but he found out that if he passed the University of London entrance exam, he could apply to any university. So he studied and passed it. He then found out that the best universities for aeronautical engineering were in the United States. So he decided to go there and he went to Georgia Tech for his bachelor's degree. He graduated in three years, top of his class with highest honors. He then went to uh, Princeton for his master's degree. And he even had a chance to speak with Albert Einstein there in German. And after Princeton, he went to Philadelphia where he met my mother, Ruth, who uh, was Jewish American and they married the following year. He then earned a PhD in aeronautical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. He founded a company and one of their inventions actually won um, a scientific and technical academy award. And then he sold the company as part of the deal. He moved to uh, Los Angeles to run their West Coast office. And that's how we ended up in, in LA. And over the years, he subsequently founded a number of other businesses. And he also persuaded my aunt and her family and my grandfather to come to Los Angeles as well. And my parents were married for 62 years and had four children, two 
boys, two girls, and five grandchildren. And my mother passed away in 2020. And my father passed away last year, just one and a half weeks before his 95th birthday. And this is a photo of our family with the Byers family in 2014. And here's a photo of my father and Mincha Byers in 2005, and she lived to over 100. And Peter and Gertrude Byers and Pastor Vullings and Yuk Westerville and the Westerville Group, they were all recognized by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority, as righteous among the nations. And this is a picture of Mincha accepting the medal on her parents' behalf. And before talking a little bit more about the buyers and introducing them, I wanted to add that one of the reasons I share my father's story is because it touches upon a number of important and universal themes. One is the importance of resilience and determination. And we hope that when you observe that despite all of the hardships that my father had to face, that he was not only able to survive, but to succeed as well, that this will inspire you to overcome any obstacles you may have in your life and feel encouraged that you too can have a good life afterwards. Another theme is the importance of helping others. My father always focused on the positive and about the people helping him rather than those trying to kill him. As such, whenever we share the story, we highlight these courageous people, many of them non-Jewish, who risked their lives through their efforts. His story, his story is therefore has a positive call to action that hopefully inspires people to be upstanders rather than bystanders when they see injustices. And a related theme is the importance of possessing tolerance and compassion and empathy toward people of all faiths and backgrounds. And another theme is the value of education. And because of my father's emphasis on and education by continuing to learn while in hiding and by earning a PhD and becoming an award-winning scientist and successful businessman despite not having seventh through 12th grade, we hope he serves as a great role model in motivating people to continue their education. And all of these themes are more important now than ever since Jews have been experiencing the highest levels of anti-Semitic incidents in many, many decades. And as such, sharing my father's story is not just about educating about the past. It contains many important lessons that can hopefully inspire people to do the right thing in the present and in the future so they can make a positive impact, not only in their own lives, but in the world. And because these messages are timeless, I decided to take a more active role in helping my father share his story to as wide an audience as possible. Um, in a number of years, and for many generations to come, a number of years ago, he began writing about his life. And I then edited and published his, his document, and the resulting collaboration became his number one best selling autobiography, also called Determine the Story of Holocaust Survivor, Abraham Perlmutter. It's available on Amazon. We also published the book in Dutch and most recently in German, as was mentioned at the beginning of the program. My father and I have also given talks to thousands of people at schools and museums and other venues. And But I also felt that there were certain benefits in conveying my father's story with a documentary in addition to the talks and autobiography. For example, a significantly larger amount of visual materials, including photos and videos and documents could be included. In addition, with the film, I could also include interviews with some of the people who helped my father including Westerville Group member Jan Smith and Mincha Byers, who lived in the house at the time my father was hiding there. And because I had a particular vision for the documentary, I decided to direct, write, produce, and edit myself. And the film has been shown at film festivals, museums, schools, and other venues, and has won multiple awards. And one aspect, one unique aspect of the documentary that's different than many other Holocaust films was that I created it specifically to be accessible to audiences starting as young as nine years old. The visual materials in the film, as many of you saw, are age appropriate for younger audiences. And I purposely avoided using graphic traumatizing imagery. And if anyone you know would like to show the film to a school, please contact me. I've also developed an accompanying study guide for the film and book for students. And another unique aspect is that it emphasizes the special relationship between my family and the buyers. And in addition to the interview with Mincha Byers, the film also includes interviews with two buyers' descendants, Hank and Emma Byers, which helps to illuminate 
how an act of kindness can positively impact not only the person receiving the help and ex you know, extending the help, but the descendants of both parties as well. And so I'm very pleased that Hank and Emma and two other members of the Byers family, Jerome and Max, are here today for the Q&A. And so now I would like to introduce them. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And so first, I'd like to introduce Hank. And Hank is the grandson of Peter and Gertrude Byers. And he's also the son of Harry Byers. Remember, Harry was 22, 23, and went on that last perilous journey with my father to liberation. And in addition to being interviewed in the documentary, he also helped in gathering historical visual materials for the film and with the translation of the Dutch version of my father's book. And um, as Phil mentioned, Hank lived with our family for five years in Los Angeles during the 1980s. He currently lives in West Bray, in the Netherlands, which is about 10 miles from Klubenforst, the village where my father hid out with his grandparents. And he works as a multilingual instructor at Pontus University in Venlo. And that university is actually where we had the Netherlands premiere of the film this past October, just one and a half months ago, shown to a group of Dutch and German students and educators. And I also gave the next day a talk to German educa educators in one of Hank's classes there. And I would next like to introduce Jerome Byers. He's the 28 year old son of Hank. And he was the primary translator of the Dutch version of my father's book. And he also assisted with the translation for the film and in gathering historical visual materials for the film. He lived with us um, in Los Angeles for three months, um, about three or four years ago. And he currently lives in Mesbray. He has a master's degree in history and works on various projects for the local government. And Jerome is actually named after the son of my Aunt Taya, um, my cousin. He passed away in the 1990s. So Jerome is named after him, which is very special. And the next I'd like to introduce Emma Byers. He, she is the 27-year-old daughter of Hank. As mentioned, she's interviewed in the documentary. And she stayed with our family for eight months in 2017. She earned her master's degree in integrated food studies at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And she now works as a junior project leader on agri-food and biocircular economy projects in Venlo to find solutions for a more healthy and sustainable food system. And finally, I'd like to introduce Max Byers. He's the 25-year-old son of Hank. And he stayed with our family for six weeks about a year ago. Max has a business degree from Radboud University in Nijmegen, and he's currently working in the energy sector, helping businesses deal with the energy transition. And now I would like to hand it over to Mark for the Q&A. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much for giving us that fascinating insight into your father's story. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to uh, give you, but I would like to invite everybody participating here today to also put questions into the Q&A as well. So we can, you know, you don't want to just hear from me, I'm sure of it. Um, Karen, I would like to start off by asking you, how much of your father's story did you know growing up? And, and have you had the opportunity to visit the Netherlands with your father and see some of the places where he uh, was hiding? Yeah, so when I was younger, my father mostly shared his story about his captures and his near captures. Um, by the Nazis and by, about his subsequent escapes. And he also talked about the people who helped him, including the buyers. And as the film mentioned, you know, Harry and mentioned Hank all visited us in 1984. And then as I mentioned, Hank stayed with us for five years. So through all of that, I became very familiar with my father's time with the buyers. And separately, I also knew that many of our relatives were killed in the Holocaust since we did not have a large extended family. But my father did not really elaborate on that when we were young. But in terms of visiting the various places with my father, um, my sister and I actually lived in the village of Hubenforce for a summer with Hank and his mother. His father had passed away at that point, just down the street from where my father had been hidden. And at the end of the summer, my parents joined us and my father showed us the very various meaningful sites in the village and in the buyer's house and, you know, where he had been hiding. And Mincha Byers, she was actually still living in the house at that time. 
1994, there was actually a reunion for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the village. So we all, our entire family went there. And while there, we also visited Rotterdam. And that's where we met up with Jan Smit, who was a member of the Westerville group. So in the film, we have a little bit of him. That's from 1994. And in 2005, there was a 60th anniversary of the liberation of the village. So again, we went there. And that time, we actually retraced my father's steps. And Hank went with us, too. We visited all of the refugee camps where my father lived. So, And we also went to The Hague, where he lived for almost three years. And we went to Le Streff, the the pioneer camp where my aunt stayed. And so it was very you know, moving and special to see all of these places. And then separately, not in the Netherlands, we also visited Vienna with my parents and my father showed us, you know, the building where he lived for the first 11 years of his life, where his schools were, um, actually where he ran away and the policeman caught him, uh, where my grandparents um, textile store and, and places like that. So. I highly recommend uh, we've posted in the chat again the link to watch the documentary where you can see photos from a lot of these places in the documentary, which I highly recommend. So I also want to hear from the buyers tonight. And I also want to honor the fact that for those of you who don't didn't think of it, the buyers are in the Netherlands where it's six hours ahead of us. So it is very late for them. So I want to make sure we utilize their time well here. So I'm going to start with a question for Hank. Um, Hank, I would love if you would tell us a little bit about your family who hit Avraham and you know who they were and what their lives were like before the war. Yeah, well, as as Karen said, um, my grandfather, he was a a farmer, we grew asparagus, one of the first in the village that was kind of a special crop that uh, that brought some extra prosperity in the village where we lived. It was a basically Roman Catholic village in the southern part of the Netherlands. A bit, the nearest city was Venlo, about seven kilometers south. And it was a, a, a very small community, small net within its, its you know, daily life cycle, having to do a lot with religi religious uh, holidays at the time, so a very normal life. They, and when I say they were uh, six kids in, in, in my father's family, my father was the youngest. And um, so, you know, it was a, a very normal, normal family like you had many in that, in that village at the time. And I'm going to ask Emma the next question. Uh, Emma, how much of your family's story with Avraham did you know while you were growing up? Uh, yeah, for me, it's a story that I've known since I was very small. Of course, um, when I was a small child, I didn't know the story uh, accurately. I learned more about it when I went to, uh, well, middle school around that time, where I also learned more about the Holocaust and at that period, also more about uh, what my great grandparents did during the time hiding Avron. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to check the Q and A here a second. Um, ah, this is a good question, um, Hank. This might be better for you, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask it. Um, did your neighbors know that <clears throat> Mr. Pulmutter was being hidden, or Pulmutter was being hidden there? And I think, um, Karen, you might also talk a little bit about what was going on in the town at the time, because I know the answer a little bit to this. Uh, yeah, the, the, the neighbors knew, because uh, the neighbors were hiding a, a, a Jewish baby. Selma was her name. But she was, I think she was only four, four months or so when, when she came to, uh, to be with, with the neighbors. So because many families were hiding Jewish kids also, uh, from the orphanage in, in, in Amsterdam that was a whole line of, of uh, hiding places. So yeah, they knew. And off went there too and when they, you know, they had a radio there because the radios were not allowed. So when they, you know, they listened to the radio, the Dutch radio from, from BBC in London. People knew. Yeah, they knew. I... They, they, they knew who was uh, to be trusted and who was not to be trusted. So... Yeah. yeah. And as Hank was just mentioning about the radio, so as he said, it was illegal to listen to the radio. So my father would be the one listening because 
um, you know, if he was caught, it didn't matter whether he had a radio or not. And then he would tell the other people what was going on, you know, with the war. And as Hank said, uh, many of the people hid the Jews, but um, in and so the neighbors knew as well. But the non, the mayor was uh, pro Nazi, as I mentioned, and so you have you had to be careful, you know, who who you told. Uh, this question is directed toward Jerome and Max. Uh, it is, how does it feel when you interact with Germans who are about your age about this subject? Uh, you must be proud of the descendants of heroes, yet uh, are not to be blamed for the actions of their grandfathers. I understand German kids study their family histories during Holocaust education. Did they tell you about what their forefathers did in World War II? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, if, if you want to go for that one, let's see what you got. <laughs> Uh, well, I um, regularly work with Germans for my work, uh, a region borders Germany. So, uh, and um, honestly, the uh, the war never came up. There was never a, um, a reason to talk about it in in, in that way. Just. Uh, yeah, for me, I have uh, some German friends. And um, I have to say, like, it comes up every now and then in, in sort of the stories, but it never really goes into their, fami their family background into the war, actually. So I think that's kind of the, my experience with that is that they recognize it and they, but they, they just don't really go into detail about, uh, about what family members might have done. Uh, that's kind of typical. Like, it's actually a, the question is actually quite good. I never really uh, thought about it too closely, but yeah, but that's actually something uh, from my experience that they haven't really gone into it. And it's also not, you know, you don't zoom in on it also, but not consciously, I guess. It's just less of a conversation topic for our generation. Interesting. Um, Karen, there's a question in the chat that kind of is related to a question I had for you. So I'm going to combine them a little bit. Um, your father talked a lot about how he trusted um, the Dutch quite often and how, how comfortable he was, even mentioning several times in, in his testimony that he gave to uh, the Shoah Foundation that he would regularly walk up to people and just announce that he was Jewish. Um, the question that the person asked in the chat is, why do you think so many people hit, or Dutch people hid Jewish people? I would like to expand that question a little bit to ask also about your father's recollections or feelings toward the Austrians uh, before he left. Yeah, so in terms of the Dutch, um, there's actually been, you know, some papers on that about why the Dutch um, hid so many. And some of the reasons they said was what they called empathetic rescuers, because people were, um, you know, familiar with um, or working with or living next to, you know, uh, Jewish people. Um, others belong to political religious organizations. Um, that, uh, you know, felt that Jews should be helped. And so as a member of that organization, they all or religious, you know, affiliation, they also wanted to help. That's an example is like the Ten Boom family, which is kind of known. And also, um, just from a humanist uh, point of view, like Yup Westville, he just felt it was the right, right thing to do. And, um, and so the end result was like uh, my father always thought that about 95 percent of the Dutch were anti-Nazi. And also you have to remember that um, the Germans invaded the Netherlands and Austria invited the Germans in uh, and it was a union. So it was very different. So they the Dutch were not happy, you know, with Germany being there. And so they wanted to do whatever they can uh, to fight the Germans and to help the people. And um, so related uh, to that second question then, I mean, my father actually, you know, he loved Austria. He lived there for his first 11 years. He always talks about how it's a beautiful country. And um, so he had fond memories up until, and then the movie says this too, until um, the day after the Angelus and, and Hitler entered Vienna, then all of a sudden he saw that people changed, you know, and they were very anti-Semitic and they were beating him up and, and just, you know, everything like changed overnight. So then it was very different at that point. I'm going to ask a question and I would love for Hank to answer and then Emma to answer as well. Um, and I'm going to 
actually answer a question by asking my question. Um, several people asked if the, the buyers were honored as righteous Gentiles, which they were. And I would love for Hank and Emma to kind of tell us what, you know, how that impacts you as further generations. What was it like for your generations to have a family member that were your family members that were honored as righteous among the nations? Well, I, I remember very well when the ceremony was and when when the Yad Vashem award was handed over to my aunt uh, for, for my grandparents, uh, but also the uh, niece of Pastor Willings received it at that time because Alf made it happen for for them, <clears throat> and it was a, it was a, it was you know a, a kind of very official with the we did it in church so the whole church was was packed so then you had a sense of oh this is a you know, a story that um, that really carried some weight. But also, I have to say, because so many um, families shared the same experience in the village, even even families who were not hiding people uh, knew about it, and they, they did all kinds of things to help. So in that sense, it was a real community thing, you can say. Yeah. So yes, it had impact, definitely, yeah. And Emma? Uh, yeah, I wasn't born yet at the time the ceremony was held. But um, I think for me, knowing that my great grandparents uh, received such a medal is, of course, you know, a great honor to our family. And I think for me, and I think I can speak for my brothers as well, is that it gave us, um, you know, a good example of what a hero looks like and what they do. And I hope, again, that for the future that I can also help people. And I think for me, it means what can I do today to help people? And for me, that is what I'm doing in my job to, you know, help to make a better food system and fight climate change. And obviously also tell people about this story, because I hope that, you know, my children and children that come after will, will get these morals as well. Wonderful. Uh, Karen, there's a question from Tova. Um, did your father maintain his relationship with God through the experience? Um, yeah, I mean, he uh, was brought up uh, very religious. And I would say um, afterwards, he was more conservative, which is, you know, kind of in the, in the middle. But he still very much believed in God. Um, and, you know, Judaism was very important to him and our entire family and in honoring the traditions. And so, yeah, he still very much, um, you know, believed in God and, um, you know, like I said, wanted to pass that on to his children and grandchildren as well. Uh, Jerome and Max, I, I, I apologize that I'm going to keep asking kind of both of you questions, but since you're sitting next to each other, it makes sense. Um, there's a question from Sandra about if, if you see or is there anti-Semitism in the Netherlands today? Yes, but um, the region where we are living, uh, there are not many Jewish people here, so it's you don't really notice it here, but... Um, you, you sometimes hear about incidents in the news, like uh, uh, Jewish restaurants that get, uh, uh, how do you say it, where they put the graffiti on the walls or something mm -hmm. like that, or incidents like that. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Or sort of maybe you could say also in an indirect ways by um, sort of not framing context correctly or uh, making assumptions on... Uh, yeah, I don't really have any concrete examples in mind, but of course there are, there are some, but it's not very prevalent around us. Interesting. All right, I'm going to look through the questions here a second. Um, Karen, could you tell us a little bit about the research process that you went through for the film? Uh, you know, how you came to learn about filmmaking in general. I know you, you had some associations with it, with the film industry, but uh, tell us a little bit about creating the film. Well, from the technology side. And so first I'll talk about the research in terms of finding out more about the stories. And then I'll talk more about the 
you know, the technical part of making the film. Um, in terms of the research for both the book and the film, I searched through many different sources, including online and physical archives and museums and photo albums. And I contacted researchers from museums and archives and um, also made new personal connections that were able to provide me with information. So as a result, I was able to find um, new photos and documents, documents, information related to not only my father's story, but my aunts and some of our relatives who were killed during the Holocaust as well. And just to give a few examples, like I found uh, photos, uh, additional photos of my father at the refugee camp in Waikanze. I found a photo of him in the refugee camp Drybergen. Found photo, the, found letters that my father's aunt Annie had written to the Dutch government requesting that he and my aunt and their cousins travel on the kinder transport. And even once when he was in the refugee camp and she was trying to get him out of the refugee camp, she wrote letters saying, oh, you know, he needs to join us already. And, um, you know, and I also found like specific dates and locations of, you know, the different events of his life and when he was moved from one place to the other. And it was also especially meaningful to find photos and letters written by my aunt Taya, uh, because she never spoke about her experiences. So, for example, um, she uh, wrote a poem in the first refugee camp in Waikanze in 1939 um, about her thoughts on the camp. And so I was able to access that about uh, a researcher that I had met through uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, she found it for me in one of the archives. And my aunt had also written letters after she was caught by the Nazis and after she was liberated where she described like her experience right after she was caught in the death march. And so that was very interesting because as I said, she never spoke about it and that became available. Red Cross had it, became available in 2015. And I was also able to find photos of our Dutch relatives who were killed, some of whom we never had a single photo of before. So finally to be able to put faces to their names was really you know very meaningful and special for me. And you'll notice like in the well, in my talk and also the movie, I don't have a photo for the Van Strattens because who that's who my fam my father lived with for almost three years in the Hague because I don't have a photo of them. I am still always looking to try and find that photo. Uh, but I continue to find more information, you know, continuously and I'm continuing to do research. And in fact, just a couple of months ago, I finally, I finally found the name of the, the ship that my grandparents went on from Vienna to the British Mandate of Palestine. And just two days ago, a new connection that I made um, provided me with a document that lists all the residents of the apartment that my family, my father stayed at with the Cohens, you know, in Amsterdam. So that, that was very interesting as well. And in terms of the filmmaking process, so, I mean, I had been giving, uh, so first of all, I had, so chronologically, I published the book, you know, I didn't publish it and was gathering materials. I made a PowerPoint presentation um, and then accompanied my father, as I mentioned, and we gave talks. And so the natural evolution was, and and so, and sometimes the, the talks were um, without him, you know, and so like if I was in the Netherlands or some other state where he didn't want to travel. And so what I would do there was I would put video clips of him speaking for part of the time and other time I would be speaking. And I said, you know what though? I think it's best if all of it comes from him. So I'm going to, you know, make a documentary where he um, speaks about it. And then I will compliment his wonderful narration because he's a great speaker um, with, you know, a lot of photos and videos. And so I spent a large, uh, a long time looking for, you know, like I said, for the photos and the videos and, um, and, and Hank and Jerome helped me with that as well. And every time I found something new, I was very excited. And then I decided to, you know, because I knew exactly what I wanted to do um, and how I had always envisioned it. Um, I decided to, like I said, edit it myself. And so I used Final Cut Pro. And then I had, I worked with a professional composer so that the music, it's, we have over an hour of original music specifically for the film. I worked with, with them and with him and Steve Chesney is his name and also a production company for um, audio and colorization and things like that. So that's about the process itself. Great. Um, I'm going to ask this next question of Max. Uh, Max, through this video or you know, the film and through this relationship, I'm curious um, if what you learned about your family and your community that maybe you didn't know kind of automatically or, or through just normal everyday life growing up with, you know, with your family, kind of through the project, through the film and through the relationship with Karen. 
Um, I have to say, I learned a lot more about the lives of my great grandparents, for sure. Uh, that's something that, well, uh, you hear stories about, of course, and uh, the things that that dad told about them. But uh, going into the specific details about their lives back then um, makes you realize far more about well the values they had, which are, you know, we don't have the same lives as they do uh, these days. So that's a lot different. And then trying to figure out now a little bit later in life uh, how those value systems made the, the decisions they made in the circumstances that they were facing during the war. So I'm trying to reflect that to my life now. Like uh, I, have, I share a lot of the values, of course, but I wasn't brought up the same way. I've had the experiences they had, uh, uh, life of farming and, uh, and, and religion, like uh, in the, the way that they did. Um, but I still uh, try to maintain this, uh, those values that they, uh, they had. And so I learned a lot more about uh, their lives than I, I think I normally would have. And uh, Jerome, and, and if uh, Emma, you wanna jump in on this as well, you can afterward. Um, there's a few questions that have come up through the course of the evening. And, and I know this might be a tough question to ask, but there seems to be some curiosity about the personality of the Dutch people in your area. Uh, their willingness to rescue Jews, their willingness to, to help others, um, even, you know, what is it like today, which I kind of touched on already, but you mentioned that there aren't a lot of Jewish people in the community. What do you think it is about the people from your region and maybe even the people from your family that inspired them to, to do what they did? Well, I think um, an important factor was uh, uh, Pastor Vullings, because he, of course, he was a leader in the community and he also encouraged people to to do the right thing to 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 hide these 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 people who were fleeing uh, the the oppression from the nazis and um i think that people also knew what the right thing to do was i feel that that um yeah that, that that's the reason why they decided to be upstanders mm. and also because they were an important part of the thing is that they were approached directly And if you want to jump in, you can. Otherwise, I can find another question. No problem. Um, yeah, I think Jerome answered most of that question. I think, indeed, Pastor Willink was a, was a big influence on that in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think also in the documentary, uh, our great aunt, Mincha, she said very plainly, I mean, not plainly, I don't know the right word, but she said, um, you know, if someone asks for help, you help them. And you know, that's actually not a normal thing to to say or to do, I think, you know, um, to just say, oh, yeah, if, if you're hiding from Nazis, just come in, we'll, we'll rescue you. I don't think a lot of people were, um, you know, that that courageous to make that choice. I think a lot of people knew what was hanging above their heads. And I think they knew as well, but I think they valued um, you know, helping other people is more than being afraid. And I think that's something very brave that she said. Something I can say, I grew up in a Dutch community here in Michigan. I can say that that kind of uh, conviction is it seems to be not uncommon. Um, Hank, I have a question for you from actually another Dutchman living in Michigan, as he identifies himself, named Mark. Um, I do not want to guess your age, so I'm going to ask, uh, he asked if you yourself have memories of, of liberation, but he also wants to know about your parents' memories of liberation, uh, you know, how they, how they recall being liberated and the experience there. Yeah, well, it, 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 I'm not sure my parents, not I, I'm 64, so I was, I was. I, I thought um, so, I didn't want to. No, so I'm, I'm way beyond, beyond. No, but they, they experienced, yeah, sure, they were, uh, well, my father was still living with my grandparents, and uh, my mother lived also in the village. And um, well, the, when when the front came to to Rubbevoort, that's basically what happens. They had the battle of, uh, what was it again? Arnhem, one bridge too far, and they didn't make. They made it only to Nijmegen, and then they had to open up. Uh, you know, they liberated towards the River Maas, 
so there was quite heavy fighting and then um you know at one point um they had to evacuate the whole village because um at first the germans wanted to evacuate the village into germany but they, they couldn't do that anymore because the bridge was the bridges were bombed so they couldn't cross the river anymore and then the, they were evacuated to the town of Zevenum. and that way you know then there was that was a day that was dangerous because you didn't know what was going on that was it time when the book went off uh, didn't want to uh, to go into the with the evacuees because he was afraid the Germans might pick him out or so that was the story when he went with my father a day or two later to uh, to, to find his way to save them but yeah then they were you know everybody what can you say they were they were not in that village a lot of the houses were heavily damaged uh, so people were disillusioned oh, yeah it was war it was a hard time and they were hard hit. The, the town of Vendel was hard hit, was bombarded heavily, was heavy fighting. So, you know, how, how a war is, versus, it's very tough. But obviously, they were very happy uh, to be liberated. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, sure. And then they, you know, they went on with life. But it was always, there was always, uh, you know, everything that happened, World War II was a, a watershed in that sense. There was, all, it was always about the war. Whenever we were together, our families or whatever, many, many times, there, you know, stories were, were told, do you remember this, do you remember that? So for many years, that was, it was a huge topic, yeah, that affected my parents' generation a lot, yeah. Karen, I think we have time just for one more question here, uh, and then we will let the buyers go to bed. Um, and I think it's only fair that we end talking about Avraham one more time. And something that really came out in the film was Avraham's kind of mischievous personality. And I'm curious if you think and if he thought that kind of adventurous, brave and mischievous personality contributed to his survival at all. Yeah, absolutely. And he says it in the film, and I say it when I give talks, that, you know, being wild and mischievous and wanting to escape, that very much, um, you know, helped him to survive. It meant that he was willing to take risks and not follow the rules. And one example was when he decided to escape from the Jewish theater. You know, he had been caught with uh, one of the Cohen sons who had been living uh, with him, you know, and my father's like, okay, I'm going to try and escape. And the Cohen said, well, no, it's too dangerous. If, you know, they catch up, they'll, they'll shoot us. And my father's like, I don't care. And so that shows like where he's like breaking the rules and he's just uh, wild and he's willing to take the risks. And of course, the other times, like when he escaped from the prison wagon and when he decided to go on that minefield road. So all of these characteristics of wanting to run away and uh, just being uh, wild, that really helped him in terms of how he uh, was able to survive. In addition, you know, he was a very determined person and that's why he named the book um, Determined. And so that's why I took the same name for the film. And he was always, um, as I mentioned, he was very positive, very optimistic, always looking forward. You know, the cup was always half full. And so and that and his faith and his personality, all of those things. And of course, all the people who helped him. And as someone pointed out to me, he had good judgment and knowing who to go up to. <laughs> and yeah. all of those characteristics, I think, um, helped him to, to survive. Wonderful. Well, uh, Karen, Hank, Emma, Jerome, Max, thank you all so much for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, for those online, if you haven't already seen the film Determined, it is available to watch through December 9. Uh, we put the Vimeo link and password in the chat one more time so that you can grab that and watch. I highly recommend that you do. Uh, if you'd like to read Abraham's autobiography, which has now been published in English, German, and Dutch, as we've mentioned, we're also posting the link in the chat again one more time. Um, I'm excited to announce that the center has completed the renovation of our permanent exhibit. Uh, the redesigned exhibit incorporates new scholarship, artifacts that have not been on display, uh, improved accessibility and the use of technology to give future visitors an, um, an opportunity to connect with local Michigan Holocaust survivors and their personal stories well into the future. Uh, we hope you can all join us on Sunday, January 28th for our grand reopening. 
please check out our website, holocaustcenter.org, for more information to come. Thank you all so much for watching and have a great evening.